No, even back when we were doing miniature effects, there's certain things that I would just take on as, as like, like a, I'd see a production illustration and say, wow, this is why I want to do this movie. And I want to make this shot look just like this in the movie. And one of those that I thought was really important to me was on Waterworld um, you know, in the Stetson Visual Days, uh, where Steve Berg had done this beautiful illustration of the submarine crashed amidst the buildings of Denver. And um, we had big budget problems on that huge budget movie. And Mike McAllister was all set to just write out that that submarine and I said Mike I really want to figure out how to do this he said fine you can find a submarine we'll put it in and so we did <laughs> we found that submarine I think Gene Warren had that and uh, and redressed it and put it in there and tried so much to just make that shot exactly like that illustration and you know, we got pretty close to it I thought basically there was there were uh, there were three leads on that on Waterworld Ian Hunter was one, and he was in charge of the submerged Denver, which was which was shot over at VIFX again. Uh, so he was in charge of building, supervising the construction of that and getting that shot. And then on the D's was uh, John Sturber, who was in charge of basically the structure and the effects. So if it was steel framework and mechanics and uh, and pyrotechnics, it was John. Uh, under the direction of Bob Spurlock. We built the, the whole, all these buildings based on buildings in Denver, uh, all pre-destroyed. And there are so many gags in, in these shots that if, I mean, it, it's, it's silly. Um, the, there's a camera move that starts pushing, pushing down past the top of these buildings. And we had a, a helicopter on the rooftop and one of the things we had was uh, Tully Summers had made up these, had sculpted up these little skeletons. So we had laid, we laid skeletons out everywhere. So in the, as the camera kind of passes over the street down there, there's a, there's a bat boat. And between the buildings, <laughs> as it goes by, there's like a gap and there's this kind of shaft of light that, that goes down to this area. And it was just, you know, it's supposed to be this nice thing. Well, since Mark had worked on 2010, Ian Hunter and I thought it would be funny to put a um, a, a monolith out just in this in this gap. So I made it one by four by nine, of course, inches tall, and and put it out there. And that was the one thing that Mark called out in dailies, where he said, "All right, who put the monolith?" <laughs> because he, as the camera went by, he actually was able to spot it pretty easily. Um, but I. I think it ended up in the movie. When the camera gets gets down to um, street level, Jeff Pyle made an orca, that which is the boat from Jaws. Uh, so he made a like a crashed orca, and that's sitting there on the street. So when the camera gets down and they're they're kind of going around this turn, you know, there's a boat there, and I don't know if you can read the name on the back or not, but it it is the orca, and he you know used Jaws as a reference and, and made it look like Quint's boat. Um, <laughs> inside all these little shops, we've, we've got little skeletons all over the place, you know, down on the street level and cars. Again, there's a bat boat down there. There were some other gag cars. In, inside, there, there are like storefronts when the camera's down at, at street level. And so we just did little scenes where like the skeletons are doing stuff. I mean, just, you know, just all kinds of just odd, silly stuff. And you would pretty much have to f like frame by frame through it to see any of it. And, you know, we put it in there and it's, and I don't know how well the light hits it, uh, but, but it kind of worked well. Um, then the la I guess the last one was the sub, there's a submarine that's crashed and that's at an angle and it's actually dripping fluorescent paint like green fluorescent paint so it's like nuclear waste is dripping out of the sub down onto the the sand below it and when Kevin Costner's character goes over to to pick up that handful of sand he's standing right under the radioactive waste so that couldn't have worked out any better it's probably Ian's Ian's gag Ian really enjoyed doing a lot of found object miniatures you know, it's like, oh, let's see, let's see, you know, if we can make something out of 
Coke cans and this and that, you know, whatever junk we could find sitting around, but have it look like a really nice looking model for the shot. Um, the last show I did for Stetson, which was uh, Waterworld, has got Coke cans buried in the model. So every model's got some sort of cleverly disguised Coke can uh, floating in there. And that's my personal touch. That's my little, my little signature uh, element. So. In a shop or on a stage, filming or building or filming a model, you have a lot of people doing it. It's not like one person building one model. And um, it's much easier for people to sort of come together and see what, what's happening in front of them visually and seeing something grow and being able to contribute to it and be, sort of let that growth and that process trigger new ideas and thinking. And I just think you get so much more out of a group building a physical miniature landscape or cityscape. On Waterworld, uh, the D's tanker, my goodness, that was a big miniature. But the way it was designed was very modular. Um, Stetson's shop was, was not big enough to actually have the entire tanker assembled. Um, it was assembled in such a way that it could be trucked by flatbed to the Mojave Airport for, uh, for photography. Um, and the reason why it's in, in Mojave is that uh, the camera could swing around and you have an un un unobstructed view of the horizon. So, but in the shop, um, each section was built and then put outside in storage or for storage. Uh, the biggest pieces of that miniature that were built in the shop was the, the bow and the stern that were butt to butt. It made a really cute little tugboat type thing inside the shop. But it was, it was a good 12 feet tall. It, it reached the, the, the I-beams in the shop. Um, so logistically, that one, that was a tough one. It made the Benthic Explorer model that we did at Wonderworks look tiny. It you know, looked like a toy in comparison because it was so huge. And then uh, as far as making it look like a tanker, you know, the aging and the, the details, I was in charge of that. So all the... All the surface deck details, the storage containers, the sea containers, the, the old, you know, rusty spring beds, the car parts, the, you know, we had to match everything that they had done on the full size set because they did build a full, not as long, but they did build a full size set that uh, they could they could shoot pr uh, principal on. So we had to duplicate all their all their debris and their wreckage and then add a little extra. And so I was in charge of making all that get built, getting all that stuff built, getting the superstructure built. Because the superstructure, there was a, there was a plywood, basically a plywood version uh, that was dressed out for the beauty shots. And then we would remove that, and a balsa wood, th three balsa wood versions were made, so we could blow it up. Um, and then, of, of course, all the barnacles, uh, which I actually did the barnacles pattern myself, even though I was kind of running the crew. I did the barnacle pattern myself because I. I'd come up with this this method uh, of creating the barnacles just using a plaster, um, you know, laying out the form and using plaster, but using a sandblaster, of all things, uh, in addition to the plaster. So I would trowel on the plaster and get some interesting shapes and then just sandblast it. And depending on how close or how far or how concentrated you got with the sand, it would make all these really great little patterns in the, uh, in the plaster. And a lot of it would end up looking like barnacles. And it was just a total fluke. I just started experimenting with different w ways of, you know, like, how am I going to do this? Do I sculpt it out of clay? Do I sculpt it out of, out of foam? You know, which are all time consuming. And I think I had to turn the thing around in a couple of days. And like, well, how, what am I supposed to do here? And so I started playing around. And of course, the first few tests were a little dodgy. But then I started figuring out the methodology of it. And, uh, and strangely enough, once I had a test done that I liked, uh, I went ahead and just did the whole thing. And I think I got the whole thing fully done and dressed in like a day. Uh, and then that went off to Universal to have a mold made because it was four by eight panel. And we had, I don't know, 50 or 60 of those uh, cast out of a flexible polyester. And we literally just screwed them to the bottom of the hall uh, and then just blended them in and aged them. And uh, uh, it worked out pretty well. You know, you don't see it a whole lot, but it, it worked well enough and it matched live action pretty close. So. It worked pretty well. Um, then, of course, all the other rust and the, you know, there's I beams sticking out of the side of the ship, and all the, all that had to be made. So anything that was a detail, scale detail, was was put in my lap, and then anything that had to do with effects uh, or construction went into John's lap, and uh, with Bob's supervision. Bob was the overall supervisor on the D's.
That was a great project for Bob and me to be on together because yeah. it was a big engineering job too. Because uh, the ship had to tip up like this, it had to break in half and then sink, and then we had to disassemble it so we could pull the stern cap off for the final shot of it going under the water. We chose Mojave Airport because the low horizons all the way around it, and um, Mike McAllister, the visual effects supervisor, was going to be using digital water. It's the first big show to use digital water before Titanic. Same, you know, Arate software, but um, it was a, so it was a good choice to shoot it out there. I, and my dad is a mechanical engineer, and we hired him to do the first calculations on the structural assembly of it, and then he didn't want to come out and oversee the work when we um, moved up to Mojave out of the shop, but we also, you know, part of the design puzzle was fitting it into the shop and out the doors, so it had to be these modules, like 12 by 12 modules to get through our roll-up doors, and um, it was really amazing, and it all worked out so well, and Bob had a really great handle on all that stuff, and then finishing it is just, well, just crazy stuff. That was the last project. Um, we knew uh, Dennis Gastner and Steve Berg. You know, Dennis Gastner was a production designer on it. Steve Berg was a production illustrator on it. And as I mentioned before, the sunken submarine illustration that he made. Uh, and so we were sort of sniffing around that project. And Batman Forever was, we were bidding on that. And I just saw so much work going into Waterworld. I thought, I think I even said to Bob, you know, if we're not working on this show, we're not working. Uh, and it didn't have anything to do with which show might be better or more successful, but just the effort going into it. So we called up, we, we got the bid on Waterworld and called up um, Batman to say that we were bailing out. And I remember how angry John Dykstra was at us because he was all set to award the work to us. But I could never imagine that he really would have because I figured all that work would go to Grant McCune, his old partner, you know. We actually had sweatshirts made up that said, The Last Hurrah. And uh, that was it. Yeah, '95 was was the end of an era. So, it was uh, you know, uh, it was a short run, but it was it was a very successful run. And you know, I, I like to think that we we closed our doors on on top. You know, uh, and that was a that was a great place. It was just a fantastic place to work. Mark and Bob were are just the best to work for. And Mark uh, formed his own shop. Stetson Visual Services with uh, and drug us all along with him and we worked in that shop for years on numerous other movies that uh, I can't even remember uh, and some of us came and went to other jobs but we always ended up coming back to get on Mark's coattails 